Good evening. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Vise, and I am the co-chair of the Education Committee of the AACP, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Uh, I want to thank today June Williamson for being our moderator. She's going to be helping us in the background. Uh, if you're looking at this slide, you can see um, a little note be uh, below. Welcome to the AACP monthly webinar. If you have any difficulties, please text uh, that, uh, that number there uh, for any assistance, and she'll be glad to help you with any problems you might be uh, having. So once again, welcome to uh, the second of our webinars of the uh, webinars sponsored by the AACP. I know today we have a very international crowd, so uh, I know Reda has a big following in Egypt. So welcome everybody from Egypt and that part of the world. Love to have you here today. Thanks for being with us. Um, as, pro as we promised last month, we will be having our webinars at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time in the US. Uh, so our members in the West Coast can listen to our webinars as soon as they are done with their patients at five o'clock. As a reminder, uh, we'll be holding these webinars on the second Wednesday of every month. Uh, so you know the webinars will be recorded, so in case you miss it, you can watch them at your own leisure at a later time. Uh, we're currently working on, um, on archiving all these webinars on our website so you can watch them at whatever time you want to see them as long as you're an AACP member. That will be uh, placed on the AACP members section only. Uh, this is just another benefit of being an AACP member. So if you're not an AACP member yet, uh, please do consider joining our academy. We would love to have you. We will also provide today one CE, of uh, um, one hour of CE uh, that you um, will get after you uh, brief uh, after you uh, fill out a brief survey that we'll send you after the webinar. Uh, Dr. Chef Krish, our, our webinar side committee chair, has done a great job of programming a great lineup of speakers. So be on the lookout for emails from our central office regarding any future webinars. Remember, the second Wednesday of every month. Um, as I said last uh, month, our webinars not only serve, you, uh, uh, serve uh, to give you very relevant information uh, as a member of the ACP, but also we'll give you a little taste of our coming live courses that we have on our calendar. Uh, today's webinar is another example of one of our future courses. Um, Dr. Reda Abdel Fattah, our speaker today, will be leading a two-day course on April 17th and 18th in Dallas at the Holiday Inn Airport South titled, How to Properly Document and Present Temporal, temporal Medibular Injury Cases. Uh, this course will teach you how to be an expert witness in TMD cases, estimate things like that that uh, that we normally don't deal with at ACE as as um, uh, as, a T, as TMD practitioners, uh, such as estimating a permanent impairment, uh, percentage, uh, projection of cost and future care. Those questions that are frequently asked by attorneys in cases like this. Now, if you're one of those people that thinks you know I don't want to deal with litigation cases, I really think. Uh, very strongly that you should still listen to those courses because it's an inevitable thing that will happen as you practice uh, more and more TMD cases. We, uh, I recently have had a case and over the years I have many cases of people seeking um, disability benefits without telling you at first that's what they're seeking. So uh, taking uh, Dr. Uh, Abdel Fattah's courses will help you tremendously how to handle these difficult patients. Those patients usually don't get better because sometimes they get coaching for, from, uh, from attorneys and different things like that. So this will uh, help you maneuver all this, uh, all this different uh, difficult uh, cases. Um, so um, the next month uh, on February the 7th and the 8th, Dr. Karen Wirtz, our speaker from the last time, uh, will be holding a course in Dallas on the diagnosis and treatment of ankyloglossial uh, tether oral tissues, uh, oral restrictions, myofunctional disorders uh, with, with a hands-on portion where you can get your hands on a CO2 laser taught by Dr. Peter Beatrock along with her. Uh, her uh, the name of the course is, for, uh, is, is Phrenectomies and Beyond. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Wurz did a wonderful job presenting if you guys got to uh, listen to the uh, webinar last month, all the fine details of tongue restriction diagnosis. Um, for, uh, for those of you that are a member of the Laser Academies, uh, they will be providing a certificate 
uh, that will uh, help you fulfill the requirements of this uh, type of academies, along with a certificate that we will give you. Uh, the two-day course has, has been priced at $925 uh, for ACP members and $995 for uh, non-members, which is a bargain for 16 hours of credit that includes uh, hands-on hands -on hours. Uh, in addition, we have pricing for non-dentists uh, or allied professionals for $625. So if you have any myofunctional therapies, lactation consultants, staff members, that is a great uh, course for them to attend. Uh, there's still plenty of, st uh, of spots left on this course. So if you want to sign up for it, go to aacfp.org and click on the events and meetings tab. Another course that we are uh, have on our schedule um, would be uh, the, co uh, the course title Obstructive Sleep Disorder Breathing in Children, an Interdisciplinary Approach uh, led by Dr. Kevin Boyd and Dr. Darius Logmany. Uh, nowadays, there's plenty, you're probably bombarded by courses on sleep uh, if you live in the US or Canada, but there's very few courses that concentrate on kids and this is what this course does. I personally find it probably the most rewarding thing I do in dentistry because at this point, you're capable of changing the life of a person. You know, a kid that has these problems won't thrive in life. And when you treat them, you basically change their lives. So it's a very motivating, incredible course. Uh, that will be um, uh, done um, in Chicago uh, at the Palmer, uh, Palmer uh, House Hilton on January the 31st and February the 1st. That will be the first session of three. Uh, we will have two later sessions. Um, in um, March and in June. Uh, check the website to check the other dates, please. That will be an awesome course to attend. Um, so finally, uh, Dawn, uh, mark your calendars for the 35th Annual uh, International Symposium. We would love to have some other people from Egypt and other parts of the world come to Spokane, Ohio, uh, uh, Spokane, Washington, I'm sorry, um, where um, you'll be able to see some beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous uh, American uh, natural uh, scenes and uh, have a great symposium. Our uh, chair, Dr. Richard Goodfellow, did a wonderful job in the Toronto meeting. We had one of our best meetings ever and he promises we're going to have an even better meeting uh, when we come to uh, Spokane, Washington on uh, the 6th through the 8th of August of this year. Uh, so do mark your calendars and make plans to come in and visit us and uh, get to meet us all in person too. We'd love to have you guys over, especially the people from abroad. Um, June, what I'm going to do in a second is go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Reda Abdel Fattah. So while I read his credentials, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and switch uh, screens and give, give him control of the screens, okay? Uh, Dr. Uh, Reda Abdel Fattah is a diplomat of the American Board uh, of the American Boards of Craniofacial Pain or Facial Pain dental sleep medicine, craniofacial dental sleep medicine, and the Academy of Integrated Pain Management. He lectures local, locally, nationally, and internationally for health professionals. He's the author of many scientific articles and books. Uh, he is a board examiner for the American Board of Craniofacial Pain and the chairman of the Craniofacial Pain and Dysfunction Section of the Atlantic Coast Dental Research Clinic at Palm Beach uh, State College in Lake Worth, Florida. His Boca Raton practice stresses the evaluation and management of oral facial pain, TMD, and sleep disorder breathing. In addition to his traditional education, he earned a master's degree in material science and engineering with an emphasis on biomaterials and a master's on professional studies. Uh, with a concentration on biomechanical trauma, he combined the biological and, phys uh, and physical information gained um, for, for a broad education and his participation in the medical legal aspects to develop his protocol of handling the injury cases. He has been selected as an expert witness uh, by both plaintiff and defense attorneys in many injury cases. So I give you Dr. Abdel Fattah. Reda? Yes. Greeting everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, second uh, webinar. Uh, tonight we are going to have uh, a short presentation about a very important subject, which is a narrative report on craniofacial pain patients. Uh, the story about the narrative report and why did I select this topic? Because as an expert, uh, as a diplomat 
of um, the American uh, Board of Craniofacial Pain. Uh, many uh, insurance companies and attorneys seek my service to review uh, the cases. Uh, in addition, many other uh, doctors, patients, they seek my service to examine the patient and give an opinion. So by you being a fellow diplomat or educated by uh, the Craniofacial Pain Academy, you are going to be in a position that uh, you get more referral for your expert opinion. So because of this, I review a lot of reports. And actually, there is no standard of writing a report. Reports, some of them are very bad, are boring, are tortious to read. And some reports are very good and easy to make you feel comfortable that you can go through the entire report. So tonight, I hope that I can give you some idea about how you can write a very simple, concise, effective report that will develop your practice and will put you on the top of the other uh, doctors in the area that you will be choosing not only for treatment but also for reviewing the cases. So our agenda today for that short time is we're going to give an introduction, then we define what is the report, then we talk about the functions of the report. What is it for? How it serves you? Then we talk about requirements. What are the elements? What is required from me to get a good, simple, effective report? Common mistakes. Do we do mistakes? Yes, intentionally or unintentionally. How about formats? Uh, do we have a specific formats? I see many formats, something written on the left, something left, written on the right. There is a line in between. There is a line in the center. Uh, they give the whole thing together. They divide it into pieces. There is a lot of formats in the uh, given reports that we see. What are the types of reports? Is it only one type or too many types? Do we have a, a report for each occasion, for each request? Definitely, yes. Then we talk about the contents of the actual good effective, attractive report. Then at the end, we'll give a brief summary of what should constitute a good report. Introduction. Now, throughout this presentation, two different groups of reports will be discussed. As you know, that we have some litigious people or patients and some non-litigious individuals they seek our service. So they are two different types of reports because you are required two different issues in each report. The report is an important tool in your craniofacial pain practice. You are dealing with pain. You are dealing with injuries. You are dealing with different type of patient than the veneer patient, than the whitening patient, crowns and bridges, or perio individuals. It could be very good if you implement these kind of issues in your practice, not only for participating in litigation, willingly or unwillingly. Actually, many times you are dragged into litigation because some of your patient is involved in a lawsuit and you are the expert. You are required to do certain things. So going back to your reports, what have you done? Have you done a good job from the beginning anticipating this moment or you haven't do you have to recreate things and what will be very difficult and maybe sometimes illegal so today we are going to talk about from the beginning we are going to develop these reports in order to anticipate these moments knowledge is a power when you know something, you have more power than the other person. When you are having this power, how you present them, it is an art. It is a skill that you have to develop and you have to implement 
in your everyday practice in order to succeed. The power in presenting the case to the patient for acceptance is a good thing. It's an art. The way to present the knowledge to the insurance company through a report is an art and skills. The power and the way you present this power during the deposition or a court of law, it is an art, it is a skill, it is an education. You can't underestimate it. So the technology has improved. We have a lot of diagnostic tools. We have a lot of advancement in the science. We have too many opinions. We have too many methodology of treatment. Which one are you giving the patient? Which one are you trying to convey to your colleagues? As a matter of fact, if you are not putting in your records the clinical examinations, the diagnostic testing results, the treatment, the sequence of events and the changes, the patient refused this, the patient reviewed that, you did this, didn't work, you did that, it did work. If you don't do it, you can be accused of violating the standard of care. You are failing to establish or keep adequate records. So not only keeping the records, but the records have to be adequate because in some personal injury cases, you have more elements. You have to write the causation, the mechanism of injury, the permanent impairment rating, the projecting future care and the cost of it. These things you have to implement in your injury cases. And this is what we are going to be detailing in the two day course in Dallas in April 17 and 18. We'll go and talk about how you explain the mechanism of injury, how you explain that this injury is caused or not caused to the alleged accident. What is a permanent impairment? Is it 2%, 3%, 0%? Is it 10%? What actually the number you can give the, the, the patient and you have to defend that number. Not only give a number out of nowhere, but you have to defend that number in a deposition or a court of law when you are under oath. Otherwise you are committing perjury. So you have to be precise. You have to know what you are writing. You just don't to put a number and just hope that it works. Actually, when you put a wrong number, you can be impeached because the other side is very smart and the other side is well prepared too. So do not assume that putting any number or putting any amount of cost for the future care for the case that is going to go through without questioning you. You are going to be questioned and you will be embarrassed if you don't know how to defend that. You have to know how you are driving this number. How can you calculate this number? Why did you get this number? So a lot of elements are very important in the personal injury cases. Definition, we have to define what is the report? Is it only a piece of paper or a file in a computer documenting certain issues? Yes, it is a document and it is a legal document that summarizes the health the condition, clinical examination. What exactly did you do? Did you measure the range of motion? Did you palpate the muscle? Did you check the occlusion? What did you do? Did you take radiographs? What did you do? Did you take a panel only? You took a scorn beam CT scan? You order an MRI? What did you find? What are your diagnostic impression? And is the treatment that you recommended fits the diagnostic impression? Are the diagnostic HCU used valid and acceptable and producing certain kind of knowledge or information to make you formulate the treatment plan. What is the progress in the case? 
what is the response of the patient to to the treatment. So you have to add those elements to the personal injury report. The report is a communication tool, communication with the health personnel, the referring doctor. As a matter of fact, it is a very good tool for advertisement because that physician, when they see your name, yet you are treating those symptoms and so those diagnostic problems, they will think about you for the next patient that they encounter with. The insurance company, when they see your report, that it is good report, it is organized report, it is accurate report, they are gonna accept and pay for it. But when they see a report that unorganized, it is not showing them, not explaining to them the condition. They don't have time to investigate that report or to call you and ask you. You have to give it to them in an easy way. How about the legal profession? They don't understand a lot of our terminology. Even if you studied it, you have the command. If you are giving the information in a nice way, in a good report, most of your cases will be settled without hassle. And this is what happened to me. I don't go to the court frequently. I don't go for the position frequently, but thankfully that my cases are settled with a report because a report is okay. All what they want to do is to get information, educate them, educate those legal personnel and the insurance personnel, and they will respond to you. It, the report is a clinical opinion document. It shows your comments. It shows your analysis. It shows you your explanation about the patient's condition, mechanism of injury, proximate causation, permanent impairment. I am repeating that because it is very important and the need for future care. How can you calculate that estimate? How can you help both attorneys on the defense and the plaintiff side to solve the dispute and everyone goes home? It is very important. And again, and again, and again, it is a legal document. It is not, not only a medical document. It's not gonna be hidden under the rug. It's gonna be exposed, it's gonna be read by many people. So you better do it the right way. So the functions of the report are, it shows, describes the patient condition. It's also a mean of communication, documenting the patient, the, the doctor's diagnosis and the treatment. It's communicating with the health insurance and legal personnel. It's circumventing any doubt or speculation. Some of the colleagues who are not familiar with what we are doing and they are only hooked on the veneers and crowns and, and the bridges and implants and everything. They don't know and they are objecting what we are doing because they never exposed to that kind of science. So they have an objection. When you have a good report, based on scientific evidence. You leave no space for them to doubt what you are doing. It defends you, God forbid something happened. When you have a case, someone is putting a claim against you and you have your report complete, concise, clear, the lawyer doesn't like to mess up with you because your records are straightforward and clear. It's an evidence in the court of procedure. How many times when I go to the court and this report is read by the judge and the jury? And it is very nice, very fulfilling for me when the two lawyers are disputing about the admission of my report and they go to the judge and the judge reads it. And every time he reads a paragraph, he looks at me and smiles. He reads a paragraph and then he looks at me and smiles. And then at the end, he asks the lawyers, where does this doctor practice? You see, there is a lot of reward, psychological reward and something nice that you get when you are presenting your information. Again, advertisement, when you send this report to the referring physician and the, ref the referring physician knows 
about how good you are, how thorough you are in examining the patient, how good you are in establishing diagnosis, how good you are in planning the treatment itself. And then if you are a faculty or into a research group, you can use it for data collection when HIPAA is not an issue. So we have a lot of functions regarding the narrative report. Do we have to have requirements? Do we have to have elements? What are we needing to get a good report? It should be accurate, it should be clear, it should be simple, it should be concise and comprehensive. It should be reflecting your clinical thoroughness in evaluating and managing the patient's condition according to the standards of care. It is a nice image about you. Anything with your name written on it, it represents you. It's if you go to an interview and you are in short and shirt and sneaker, different than you are having a suit, necktie, comb the hair and nice appearance. It makes a big difference. Many people are superficial. They are not gonna look beyond the outside many times. Many times they look into the core, but when we have a report that it is messy, it's not organized, they are gonna be bored and not understanding what's going on. The accuracy is very important. Many times we have typographical errors, but sometimes you can conclude the meaning of the statement. Many other times you can't even understand what is the statement indicates. Many inaccuracies make you look not so guy that chips away from the clinical professionalism and credibility and reliability. I wouldn't send a patient to a doctor who sends me an inaccurate report. Clarity, it has to be clear. It has to be organized. It has to be in sections, in paragraphs, not more than eight, 10 lines in each paragraph to be easy digested. So I can keep reading and I can move from one paragraph to the other paragraph. What are the sections I should use? First, I have to write the name, the age, the gender, marital status, occupation, Miss so-and-so, 25 years old, white female who is married, she has two children, she is working as a clerk and so and so and so. She came with a chief complaint of pain or dysfunction, pain in the jaw for the last two weeks. Initially, she had it for last five years, but did not seek medical assistance. You see, the history of the chief complaints, the past and current medication, what medication she is taking, did she have any surgery before, any other intervening or any other cofactor or comorbidity, does she have fibromyalgia, does she have general arthritis, the bone density, we have to write all of these issues. The result of my clinical examination, the interpretation of my radiographs, interpretation of the MRI, my diagnostic impression, what do I feel? My official pain dysfunction of the muscle of mastications, is it uh, internal derangement? Is it degenerative joint disease of the TMJ? Is it myalgia? What kind of impression I have to right? My treatment plan. Am I gonna refer the patient to her general practitioner to uh, balance her sugar level, to decrease the blood pressure that she is having, the high blood pressure? Am I going to do a physical therapy? Am I gonna do oral appliance? You have to write the treatment plan and the reason for it. Other discussion, did you discuss the procedure, alternative risks, limitation, expectation of the patient, limitation of your treatment? Did you give her a choice of what she can get and what she can't get? Any self-care instruction, any nutritional counseling? These have to be written in details. 
The report should be simple. I shouldn't use big words. I should use straightforward, uncomplicated, easy to understand language because these reports most likely will be read by non-medically oriented individuals, the insurance personnel, the legal personnel, the patient himself or herself. So it has to be simple. It has to be concise. Why concise? Because unnecessary words make it boring. Make it, you know, I lose interest when I see repetition of the same thing about the same accident. She was hit from the rear. The other person was texting. Uh, she got out of the car on her own. She fell down on the grass. She waited for her husband to pick her up. The ambulance was late. All of this nonsense. I have to summarize all of these things into few nice words. Not boring, doesn't let me lose my concentration. I am focusing on the injury. I am focusing on what happened to this person. Length reports, sometimes they are needed if there is a reason for it. In personal injury cases, I might have to use four pages. In regular cases, I use two pages maximum, two and a half. It doesn't have to be very lengthy, boring. It has to be comprehensive. I have to have all the elements in that report. For example, the final report that lacking sequence of events in the progression of the treatment, it doesn't make sense. You have to complete that. You have to write, I did in the beginning, my initial examination, I recommended this, the patient followed up and the result such and such. At the same time in personal injury report, if it doesn't have the explanation of the mechanism of injury, the circumstances surrounding the accident is inadequate. You don't have a permanent impairment rating, it's inadequate. You don't have the cost of future care, it is inadequate. And by the way, this you charge the, the attorney about this because it takes time from you. So it's not wasting it is very good, productive to the practice and more respect and credibility to you as a practitioner. So the report should reflect your clinical thoroughness, reflects your education, reflects how careful you are in treating the patients. So mistakes, we do mistakes intentionally or unintentionally. Mistakes is that you can use ostentatious, you know, flashy uh, overhead with a lot of uh, logos, a lot of things like top dentist, town choice dentist, painless dentist, best dentist. The attorney on the other side will take this and say, how come? Based on what you are the best dentist, based on what you are painless dentist. And right now with this statement, you declare that you are lying. You declared your dishonesty. You declared your deception to the community. So all of these slogans, all of these statements that are not applicable should not be on your letterhead. Your letterhead should be simple. You can't have excessive explanation of your practice or false description. You are a dentist and you are writing center for head and neck and face pain and TMG disorder, snoring and sleep apnea. Yes, I know that you are a TMG guy. I, you are a snoring guy, but you are not head and neck person. Do you treat slip disc, herniated disc? Do you treat exactly all kinds of headaches? How about brain tumor? That's in the head. So this will be a basis for impeachment, a basis to make you deceptive. Center for or city center for the head and neck pain, but you are a DDS or DMD. I don't see an MD behind your name. I don't see a neurology neurology. Uh, education, statewide institute. Are you sure that there is no other office that they are like you? Are you asleep, doctor? Are you treating insomnia? Are you treating your uh, uh, narcolepsy? You are treating only sleep disorder breathing. So make it right. Don't over explain yourself international institute of facial pain and sleep disorder again 
all of these slogans and all of these names convey the dishonesty, convey the deception to the community, and it can be backfiring to you in the court of law. So you have to correct your act. Friendly language. I blatant thank or a blatant thanks for referring Mrs. So and so. Your referral is very much appreciated. Your our practice survives by your support. All of these indicate that you are trying to induce referral. You are trying to be very nice for more referral. Thank you is enough. Thank you for referring this person is enough. Deficient reports containing all of these colloquial statements, all of these things. I have been wanting to treat her job, but she does not let me do it. What kind of a language with this? Even a foreign person like me would write better language than that. So you have to write the correct language, although that I have informed her of the possible complication of this problem, she refused to have treatment. How about poor format? From one end to the other end, rambling, lengthy, unclear text, very small font, crowded. That's not good. Again, that's boring, tiring to the eyes, and then the reader will not be interested to continue. Computer generated reports, a lot of them are available in the market. Some may be good, some may be not good, but most of these statements are pre recorded and they might not be applicable to the patient. What is wrong of picking the phone and dictating five minutes report? The difference between computer generated report and dictated report is like home cooking versus eating from a can. It is very important to indi individualize your reports. And especially in the court of law, when they have two or three, four reports and they are similar, all of them similar. As a matter of fact, some of our colleagues here was impeached several times because he is using computer generated reports or they give the report to one of the junior uh, staff. That's another thing is no, no, because the staff is different than you. You are the doctor, you are the knowledgeable person, you are the educated, you are the fellow, you are the diplomat. And we'll talk about that in depth in Dallas in April. Similar reports should not be a good thing because this is mediocrity. This is just like you are doing things halfway. You don't spend the the time to perfect your performance. The format of the report, again, the format is very good because it helps you to give a value to what you are writing. Simple design front page, 12 point font, Arial or Calibri, subject related sections like what I mentioned, short to concise paragraphs, one line is spacing. Sometimes you write 1.5 because uh, this is like in an affidavit or something. Page numbering, very important page numbering. Section summary. Okay. Using the uh, designed front page, very simple, nothing flashy. 12 point font, that's good for the eyes, very comfortable. I can't use narrow aerial. I can't use 10 point font. I need a magnifying lens. I can't read more than 10 or 12 or 15 uh, lines in a paragraph. It is boring. But when I have eight, 10 uh, lines, I can stop and then read more. I can just continue reading instead of my eyes will be blurry where I was, was in, in the line number 10, line number 12, or what's going on. Again, the line space should be one line. Numbering is very important, especially if you are talking on the phone, talking to a colleague or in a deposition or a court. 
In a court, when you ask the question, oh, page number 13, line uh, 10, where, where you are going to go? If you have the good numbers, you are going to go directly and you look professional. You look like you know what you are doing. Very important to have the numbers. Summary section, again, you are summarizing everything in the report at the end to emphasize certain points. The types of reports, do we have only one type or we have too many types? Yes, we have too many types. The first one is the preliminary report, initial report or admission report, progress report, final discharge report or consultation report. The preliminary report is that when you don't have enough information and you just need to have established working diagnosis and begin the treatment without having everything else because the patient in trouble, you need to get the patient in a better condition faster. So that's a preliminary report. You can use it to communicate with other specialists, other doctors, other branches of medicine or dentistry. The preliminary report, when you have everything, you did the full clinical examination, you did the uh, imaging, you have all kind of the diagnostic aids and you establish your diagnostic impression and you are ready to execute your treatment planning. Progress report, that's an update report. The patient in the middle of treatment you need to inform the physician what is going on, how the patient is doing. So you are writing uh, a SOAP uh, IT note, uh, subjective objective assessment plan and instruction and the treatment. This is very easy. It is maximum 10 lines and you send it to the physician or sometimes the attorney if they need to have an update on the case. Final report, it's a discharge report. If it is just a pain patient, a chronic pain patient, you write the initial finding, the diagnosis, the treatment, what happened in the treatment, and that's it. Future care, maybe. For a personal injury, you have to write to add to that the uh, maximum medical improvement when the patient reached that. The uh, permanent impairment and the projected cost of future treatment. Now, if you are a consultant, you are going to see the patient one time. Now, this is based on you are provided with records and the patient will come to you for one time. So you do, you correct, you uh, uh, confirm the uh, diagnosis or you dispute their diagnosis, or you make a new diagnosis and you make recommendation, if any. But for the, uh, sometimes you have to examine the patient. Sometimes you don't examine the patient and you are paper expert. You only uh, read the papers and you give an opinion, but you have to qualify this opinion that based on a review of records, review of the provided records, and you list the records that they provided to you. I'm going to tell you something sad that some of the lawyers, they like you to be blind. They don't want to show you certain things. So you have to qualify your opinion based on what you are giving. What records did you get? Dr. 1, Dr. 2, Dr. 3, Dr. 4? but they did not give you Dr. Five and Dr. Six. So you have to qualify your opinion uh, based on what you are given. Some cases like what I mentioned, only on papers. The contents of the report. What do we have in the report? You have to know first you have to understand the purpose of the report. What exactly that report is needed for? Is it for personal injury uh, case? Is it for this accident or that accident? Because some people having multiple accidents. So you have to know exactly which 
accident, which injury you are evaluating the, the case for. The pre-accident, the accident environment or circumstances, and the post-accident, what happened regarding the treatment, regarding diagnosis, regarding everything. The clinician must rely on sound knowledge. Don't give false or pseudoscience. Many times I see the explanation of the mechanism of injury is it's not only funny, it is sad because they explain it wrong. And actually, that could be deceptive, and they call it exploitive and may be fraudulent because you are trying to explain something uh, when you are biased to certain science to make money. So you have to be using scientific reasoning based on evidence-based science, the standard of care. So the report should have an introduction, Mrs. So-and-so, and the data about her, demographic data, the, the age, the gender, the occupation, the marital status, etc., the history of the present illness, the past and current medical history, like what we said, clinical or imaging examination, diagnostic impression or diagnosis, recommendations and instructions. But when you are dealing with a litigation or injury case, you have to add the mechanism of injury, proximate causation, date of reaching the maximum medical improvement, the permanent impairment rating and how did you arrive to that number you have to defend the number not giving the number from the air future care and how it's going to cost from the aspirin or tylenol to the heating pad to a change of the mouthpiece to physical therapy to periodic examination you can classify everything that the patient might need based on reasonable degree of medical probability. Reasonable degree of medical probability, most likely than not. And in April, you are going to be exposed to all this terminology. So your testimony or your reports will be very effective. Now, if you are giving a, an opinion in personal injury cases, you have to add this statement. The review of the provided records, examination and formulation of my, my opinion were formulated or performed in a fair, honest and objective fashion without regard to financial interests of the defendant, the claimant, their agent, or myself. My opinions is based on the standards of care that are accepted in the area of expertise for the type of claimed injury and in accordance with common professional and ethical guidelines. With this statement, you are declaring that you are honest, you are doing your job in a good way, and you have to verify that the opinion given in this report are your own. It's not your assistant, it is not your associate. And you personally have read the records, examined the patient and prepared the report and signed it. You have also to affirm that you will be ready to testify in the court of law according to the state or federal laws. So there is other elements that you have to put in the report other than what you have done for the regular report. In summary, this is what I write in my reports. I write our names, Reda Abdel Fattah and Mervat al -Attar. That's my wife, my partner, doctors of dentistry. We didn't say anything other than this. We are dentists. Our address, phone number, fax, and so forth. Dentistry with emphasis on our official pain, TMG disorder, sleep disorder, breathing, period. No flashy things, but we have to say we are dentists because we are dentists. We can't remove that.
We can't say facial pain, we can't say sleep, but we have to describe exactly what we are. We write the date, then the name of the referring doctor, dear professional, thank you for referring Mrs. So-and-so, Jane Doe, to our office, period. That's it. She presented herself on that date as a 50 years old, whatever, whatever. She is working in that company. And I add a statement here because of the HIPAA. I said she authorized our office personnel to release her health information as deemed necessary. This relieves me from any future claim of violating her privacy. She presented the following chief complaint. And then chief complaints, I make it bold. I don't make it colorful in the report, but I make it bold. And then I write bilateral, daily, severe, throbbing, et cetera, et cetera. It increases by this, it decreases by this, it relieves by that, it's aggravated by this. History of the present illness, when did she have it? I just write short paragraph, short concise paragraph, clear, nothing too much, nothing lengthy. Regarding her medical history, what medication she is taking? What surgery she had? Did she have psychological treatment, psychiatric treatment? Did she have a sleep interruption? How is her diet? She's eating junk food. Go, good. She is admitting it, so we can counsel her for that. She, she, she was clenching and grinding due to work. We put the initial clinical examination, and I highlight the initial clinical examination as a new paragraph, and I write how the examination is done. Then we write the range of motion, the muscle palpation, temporomandibular joint auscultation. So we do the intraoral and then extraoral. We never say head and neck examination because the lawyer in the court and say, doctor, did you do head and neck examination? Oh yes, I did it. But did you examine the brain? No. But where is the brain, doctor? It is in the head. So your work is deficient. So all of this, what you told us, is deficient. Based on that statement that you wrote, head and neck examination. We do not do head and neck examination. We do intra and extra oral examination. Corn beam CT scan, if you do tomography, that's fine if you do panoramic fine just to write we took it in that date same day if you have it in your office and these are your findings the right tmj showed this the left tmj the upper airway if you have any problem with the teeth did you give her a tmj script for uh, a script for tmj mri did it need that and why did you order i ordered because i need to see the soft tissue of the MRI. So you record that you give her a, split, uh, a script for the uh, MRI. Your initial diagnostic impression, see, initial diagnostic impression, myofascial pain dysfunction of the muscle of mastication, internal derangement of the temporomandibular joint, bilateral capsular hypermobility of the TMJ, and rule out, rule out, there is no S here, rule out obstructed sleep apnea. Initial recommendation, you're right. Should she go to her physician? Because you don't want that something discovered later on and they blame you. I am a dentist, I am not a physician. So I referred her to her physician to rule out anything else. I am just limited to what I'm doing. I don't want responsibility. I don't want any liability. So I throw the liability on the other guys. Dental and periodontal evaluation if you are not doing their teeth and gums and everything let them go to the, uh, the, the the other dentist the general dentist then we talk the necessary records then we prescribe physical therapy whether you do it in the office or you send it outside did you give her self-care instruction did you tell her what to do what to do heat and cold application do exercise how it, what to eat to eat anti-inflammatory diet and antioxidant food or to eat junk food you have to counsel her because you have to do what can help the treatment. Now you have a statement at the end. I informed Ms. Doe 
of the procedures, alternative risks, limitation, expectation, and the need for her compliance. You have to help me, Mrs. Doe. I need your help to help you. She was given a chance to ask many questions and they were answered to the best of our ability. I informed her of the possible complications and risks in delaying, interrupting, or modifying this treatment plan. If she goes and buy an over-the-counter mouthpiece and she stick it in her mouth, if she goes and buys uh, um, an ultrasound from the internet and she is using it, I'm not responsible. You have to advise her of what's good and what's not good. Most of probably her face to what? Is she going to live the rest of her life with an oral appliance? Is she going to go for orthodontics? Is she going to go for occlusal rehabilitation? Write that so no one comes back and say, oh, you didn't tell me that. Then you say thank you very nicely. Thank you again, and please feel free to contact me with any question you might have. You are concerned about the patient. You write your name, your degrees, and of course, if you are a diplomat, it will be great. You have to write that because you have to inform the other doctor that there is something called diplomat, something called fellowship. There are a lot of organization teaching us, and they are available nowadays and you are trying to tell them that we are not just only concerned about teeth and gums but we go beyond the gums and teeth i hope i give you something useful for everyday practice and i am going to stay uh, up to the uh, board here to answer uh, any questions Uh, thank you very much, Reda, for a very wonderful and insightful uh, webinar, very authority, uh, authoritative uh, and information. Um, I think we all need to really look at our records very closely and, and, and get into good habits of writing great, um, great uh, reports like you do. Um, I, I'm going to see uh, uh, if, if June, if you can go ahead and put up my screen for a second, I will... Um, have some information um, if we can we'll see uh, okay perfect um, I do uh, have a couple of questions uh, Dr. Weiss that have come our okay. way awesome if, awesome awesome would, I'll, I'll, would, I'll go over this as soon as we go over the questions huh? let's go over the questions quickly I um, I had one from uh, uh, Dr. Malvin Dottie from Canada here what is the maximum percent of disability uh, that can be allocated to TMD in a patient? So that question would be for Dr. Fatah. Uh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> What's maximum? It depends on the case. I have to see the case because now are you going to do only the rating for the physical, uh, uh, the permanent impairment? By the way, there is a difference between permanent impairment and that's our function as healthy care and there is disability and that's not our job the disability is something like disability from work that's work related so we cannot say disability we have to be confined to the permanent impairment and this is what you are going to learn in the two days uh, seminar in Dallas what is a maximum impairment it depends Depends. Are you doing physically, functionally, or psychological? So it depends. It can vary. I hate to give you a number uh, because that could be very harmful if someone using it. But you have to dissect the case and you have to uh, exactly study and analyze before you give any number. Thank you, Dr. Fatah. Um, I have another question. Um, how do you go about pro proving cause and effect? in accidents versus pre-existing issues? Very good, excellent uh, question. Now, you have the post-accident diagnostics. You have the mechanism of injury. You have the records prior to the accident. So we have three categories. Before the accident, the circumstances surrounding the accident, and post-accident sequence of events. 
you see, you try to reconstruct the condition before the accident from the records. Then you see the effect of the accident. Did the accident initiate the disorder or the problem? Did the trauma aggravate or precipitate a pre-existing condition? So you have to reconstruct the pre-existing condition and you value it. Then you see the aggravating incident, whether a slip and fall, a automobile accident, uh, a hit um, you know, in the face or whatever. So you have to study the circumstances surrounding the trauma. Then you see the sequence of events. You compare and you make some kind of a scenario. Then you can prove if it is precipitation of uh, uh, an injury, if it is aggravation of a pre-existing injury. For example, the patient has been grinding her teeth and wearing down her enamel for 10 years. She went through, she bit through several oral appliances. She had an accident. The accident was only fender bender, nothing. Didn't hit her face, didn't even move in the car. Would that be an aggravation? No. Let us say that she hit her head. To what part of the vehicle? Is it the padded headrest? Is it the, the steering wheel? Is it the, uh, uh, the airbag deployed and hit her face? So you have to see exactly what happened in order to estimate. If you have the head was hitting the steering wheel, the chin, that's a direct trauma, easy to explain. If you have the airbag deployed and hit the face, did you have any scar on the face? Did you have bruises? Did you have burn? So all of these factors have to be added. And this is what we are going to explain in April in Dallas, God willing. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatah. Your presentation was wonderful. Lots of great info. Dr. Weiss, do you have a couple of closing statements? Uh, yes, I will do. Uh, Reda, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you in April the 17th and 18th here in Dallas. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this course. Uh, if you guys are interested in signing up for this course, I, I put up that slide with information. But also, um, we will have, um, you can go to the website, and what you will do is go to the events and meetings, uh, and then you'll get a drop-down list and then you have a direct link to the uh, to register online for this course. Uh, just just scroll down and you'll find the course there. And uh, just you uh, just click on the registration link, please. Um, I'll uh, I don't have anything else to say other than uh, be on the lookout for our next webinar uh, that will be on the second Wednesday of uh, February. And uh, uh, please uh, have a wonderful wonderful uh, 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.